our water store. That's more. Oh, okay, okay. You treat that water with your Smith yeah, we've got Michael Deal here, general manager of the Jarrett Canyon Mine. Um, we're standing in the bottom of the pit right now, and you can see all the terraces, and then what happens after you get to the end of the bottom pit in the life of mine, you go underground. And we have the trucks behind us moving the ore around. But Michael, I want to ask you, you know, about the ore in um, Jarrett Canyon. You know, you have your oxides first, right? Then you've got your refractory ore and double refractory ore. And can you see that in the walls there, the oxides? Yeah, so you can see the oxides are typically a quite a bit lighter. Yeah. And then it quickly transitions into that dark black material. That black is um, more of the double refractory ore. Yeah. So you've got high sulfide, high uh, organic carbon in that material. Okay, can you see a difference between the single and the double? You can't really see the difference um, so much in, in this style deposit because the, the, the darkness of the color really hides whether it's sulfide or organic carbon. Okay, so, how do you determine that? Um, it's it, You basically do a what's called a leco, so it's an assay of the ore, yep. and you can get uh, the characteristics of uh, carbon and sulfur. Okay. So it's an, it's an analytical method. So when the ore is trucked in back into the uh, the mill. Then, we're then you're testing it, it. Exactly. then you're analyzing it. Exactly. Is it pretty consistent or does it vary a lot? Um, there, there's quite a bit of variability and so the key for us is to understand the variability to get our right blends. Um, okay. So we're, we're, we're measuring it underground, we're okay. measuring it at the surface, we're measuring it before head of the plant. So okay. Constant evolution of the Okay. Plant. This smaller one's a mine truck. Um, it's You can see it's lower profile, so it's able to fit in the portal and it carries the ore from the faces outside the mine and then they dump it back down there. So these trucks are the ones that actually go in the mine. And then the bigger trucks are the ones that pick up the ore and they bring it back to the mill. And then you can see all the ore right here. You can see the blue ribbon. You can see the red ribbon. They take assays of the ore. Obviously they want the higher grade, the better. The blue and the red is the higher grade stuff. So that is what they're loading up onto the larger trucks to bring back to the mill. And then there's some yellow ribbons down there and the yellow ribbons is lower grade stuff that they kind of just, you know, when they're running low on ore, they'll run that later because it's lower grade. They'd rather run the higher grade stuff first. Um, and the, you see the dark color, that's a uh, double refractory. It's, uh, it's, you know, sulfur that's in the rocks that makes it black. That's the sulfides, the sulfides ore that Nevada is known for in Jared Canyon. That needs the roaster process to unlock the uh, gold from the sulfides and the carbon. And then here's some of the ore right here. It's dark, uh, refractory, double refractory ore. You know, some gold mines, it's epithermal which means it's narrow vein, but it's much higher grade. Uh, so you gotta follow the veins out and you can actually see some of the gold in the epithermal deposits, but these deposits are usually lower grade. Um, you can't actually see any gold in it, which is why you know they didn't discover gold in Nevada until the 60s and 70s with Newmont and Barrick. Uh, but you know they, they process it and they're able to extract the, the small amounts of gold from the refractory ore, to make it profitable. So the underground trucks are 20 tons. And then the larger trucks are what, 70 tons? They're 100, 100 tons. They're 100 tons. And they, they take it to the mill. But yep. Each truck load that they take is approximately 15 to 17 ounces in that, of gold in that. 17 ounces in that 100 ton truck. Right. So that, it's equivalent to around roughly $30,000 revenue per truck okay and these guys and they make 20 to 25 trips every day to the mill the big the big trucks big make truck. 20. yeah there is there more than one big truck we have four and each of those does that many trips well in total in there's, total there's so each one would do six or seven oh Okay, okay, okay. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So they work like this all day long. Yeah. Yep. Bringing the ore out and bringing it back to the mill. Yep. Yeah, all right. Awesome. Thanks. So the ore comes down from the mine in the 100 ton trucks. It gets dropped in right there into the crusher. They crush the big rocks and the little rocks. It gets brought up the conveyor and then it gets dropped into the um, another crusher, crushes it into smaller rocks. That right there is a heater. They, they heat the ore to 500 degrees and that's, that's part of the heater too. Because if you put wet ore into the roaster, it'll spark, it'll spontaneously combust. So they heat it up to 500 degrees to get the moisture out. Um, and then they don't want to heat it up too much there because they want to keep the cyanide in there. They want to capture all the cyanide during the roasting process because it's pretty um, you know, noxious uh, sort of 
uh, contaminant. And then they have the ball mill. The ball mill is inside the plant there. The ball mill will take the smaller rocks that are you know less than an inch and then crush it up to a fine powder, which they then run through the uh, roaster. Yeah, so essentially what we have to do is uh, the, the roaster itself is designed with two stages. Yeah. Fluidized bed. Yeah. Uh, the first stage was burning off the sulfide material. Yeah. Exposing the gold. Hey, what about the M&Ms? Oh, yeah. Explain, so, explain the M&Ms. Right. So the double refractory means that there's two components of the ore itself that we have to address before we can leach the gold out. So the best analogy is a peanut M&M. So uh, the outside shell of the M&M is uh, basically like a sulfide. So once you get out of that layer, you then have to get rid of the chocolate layer before you can get to the M&M or the peanut itself, which is the gold. Uh, so that's basically what we're doing in the roasting process is we're removing that shell of the M&M. Uh, that's our sulfides, burning off the chocolate, and then we can then leach the peanuts and go through the dry coat. Yep, yep. And, uh, you know, it's a fine balance, right, between with the whole process? Yeah, so the key for us is blending. Um, so the, the roaster itself runs anywhere between 1,000 and 1,250 degrees. And, and we have to blend at the front of the process to make sure that it's got enough heat um, because we need the heat to burn off the, the sulfide and the, and the organic carbon or else our recovery will, will suffer. So finding the balance, that right balance of sulfide and organic is a critical piece um, to, to keep the roaster hot and, and get our recovery. Yeah, okay, excellent. And the recoveries have been pretty good recently. Yeah, so we run about 86% recovery. Yeah. Um, it's dependent on head grade, yeah. um, but we, we've identified several opportunities for us to keep uh, optimizing recovery. All right, and then Michael is from Nevada Gold, the big joint venture uh, between Newmont and Barrick right down the road. And First Majestic was able to, you know, poach him. Um, you, know, you know, Michael likes the entrepreneurial aspect of First Majestic being able to contribute right to the bottom line. So Michael came over and you ended up bringing your whole team, right? Yeah, we've got a whole new uh, management team. Um, we've got very excited about that group. They've got a ton of experience in roasting uh, business here in northern Nevada. And we're yeah. excited about what this team can bring to Jared Canyon. Yeah, that's good, you know, because Jared Canyon previously was owned by private owners that didn't put a lot of capital into the project for years. Now you get First Majestic with deeper projects that, you know, if Michael has an idea that he wants to get implemented to improve the mill, they'll implement it the next day versus a whole bureaucratic process or, you know, no process at all so things are gonna yes yeah, start moving forward soon here yeah, which is great you know one of the reasons why Jarrett Canyon is unique right because it has this huge roaster and there's there aren't many in the world there's how many like four or five and three of them are here yeah, in Nevada so there's three in Nevada so Nevada gold mines has two yeah uh, we have one um, but they're, they're critical in this region because of the organic carbon uh, that, that's prevalent the part on the Okay. We were talking last night, we were talking about the uh, the roaster versus the autoclave, right? Yeah. And the difference between the two? Yeah. So typically you'll uh, you'll run an autoclave when you have single refractory work. So you just have that sulfide component uh, where you have to unlock the sulfides and then you can leach the gold. Uh, when you have the, the double refractory, you need extra temperature. So an autoclave will operate at lower temperatures but high pressure and that the roasters can operate between 1,000 and 1,250 degrees Fahrenheit um, because you need to burn that organic carbon and the autoclave can't get hot enough to do that. Don't um, deposits go through different stages, right? It goes from oxide to the single refractory to, was this ever single refractory at Jarrett Canyon? Uh, Jarrett's never been single refractory. So the, it, it was the first roaster built in the region yep. uh, because it was identified early on that it, do, it doesn't have quite as, the, the geology here isn't quite as, um, straightforward where you have the oxide, the single refractory, right. uh, like some of the other areas in the region, some of the other mines in the region. And uh, so that's why the roaster was built early on, is to capture that, uh, the, the depth of oxide is pretty small here, and then it gets quickly into that double refractory section. Yeah, okay. So the geology is different. And then the guy, who invented this, uh, this uh, roaster? Uh, so the company's called Door Oliver, that designed it. Right. Um, Freeport Mac Moran designed. Right. Um, and it's, it's same as the Gold Strike Roaster. Now they license the technology, right? Yeah, they, they, they patented it. Patent on it, and when Gold Strike built the roaster, uh, they had to pay three port back to the patent. Okay. Michael, so you know, all the ore goes through the roaster, all the impurities are uh, taken out, uh, the ore get, the concentrate gets drenched with water, it goes into the thickener, right? Yep. And then it settles down the bottom, you draw it from the thickener, then we take that so thickened solids yep. and we uh, pump it over to our CIL circuit. What's in those solids? What is that? So that, that's the calcine, it's got the gold yep. still left, it's, our, it's the solids that are out of the, out of the roaster. Okay. Process. 
So we've removed as much of the sulfide and organic as we can. Yep. Um, there's still uh, solid ore left. Um, but what we've done is we've exposed those surfaces so now that we, the cyanide mm. can attack it and mm. we can recover it. So that's what we do here. We, we pump it over. We pump it into a series of tanks um, in the carbon leak circuit. Um, we add cyanide, lime, stick the pH up so that we don't off-gas cyanide. And then uh, within the system, there's carbon, like uh, our activated carbon. Yep. And we, um, the, the gold gets, goes into solution, kind of like uh, it's a salt in the water. It absorbs onto the carbon, like a Brita water filter would absorb metals. Uh, we then get, uh, extract the gold off of the carbon through a stripping circuit. Uh, we take that stripped circuit, put it through a sludge, and then we pour the sludge um, at, at our gold and silver. And the sludge is the goes into the gold room, and that's where you pour in the gold. Exactly. How, that, how much of that sludge is waste, and how much of it is gold? Uh, so we will, we'll get about 500 pounds, um, which will equate to a couple of thousand ounces of gold. Oh wow! So, so it's it's, it's, a, it's generally about five to ten ounces per pound. Okay, so sludge. it's like 50% gold and 50% uh, sludge? Pour, or? Um, the, 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 the ratio by weight is yeah. about uh, like 15%. 15% yeah. sludge? Uh-huh. All right, and then you just burn that off. We burn that off. And then you pour the bar. Pour the bars. Yeah. All right, good, which we're going to see right now. Hey, this is Garrett Goggins, Silverstock Analyst. Uh, we're here today at Jarrett Canyon in Elko, Nevada, and uh, Keith Newmeyer, CEO of First Majestic Silver, joins us. So, Keith, you know, I've been following you guys for many years. Um, I've seen you make the transition from, you know, running six, seven mines, um, you know, and it was uh, back when the silver market wasn't great, and it was tough managing the profitability. Now, you've got three strong um, operations. You just purchased Jarrett Canyon, and then your acquisitions in the past, right, um, with Silvercrest Mining, for Santa Elena for like 130, 130 mil in 2015. And that was a good acquisition because you could see the free cash flow. Like you were making $30 million a year. So the payback was whatever, five years. It was quick. Yeah. And then you could see the same thing with uh, San Dimas that you bought out of bankruptcy from Primero and you paid what for that? You paid about, about 330. Yeah, 300 mil for that. But now you're stepping up even further. Now you're paying 500 mil for this operation, the gold operation. So I'm wondering, you know, you say that it checked almost all the boxes except for the silver, you know, um, it's a gold operation. So why, what what attracted you to this asset? Well, for first thing, I think, you know, we're not in the same market as we were back in 2015. You know, we, we picked up Silvercrest right at the bottom of the market. Oh yeah. You know, it was a unique acquisition mm -hmm. uh you know san dimas um you know came to us as, as you said you know another unique acquisition mm -hmm. we were the logical buyers for that asset you know because of our our footprint in mexico our footprint in durango yep so it you know should have been our in our portfolio and should have been there much earlier than it was mm -hmm. actually uh, but nevertheless we finally were able to add that um you know this asset you know came came to light um really mid last year and then i started talking to eric sprott about it and it just made a ton of sense. You know, you're right, it did not check the silver box. Mm. And we did, you know, pay concealed, you know, spend a lot of money for it. Right. Um, uh, but, you know, do do we think we're going to make the, that those dollars back? Absolutely. You know, when we looked at this asset, of course, you know, it didn't have the silver, but um, it's a dory producer. Yep. So we now have four uh, mines in our portfolio that all, all are producing dory bars. Yep. You know, there's seven mines that you referred to. In Mexico, four of them were Doria, were concentrate producers, mm -hmm. and producing concentrates is a nightmare. And yep. I'm so happy not to be in the concentrate business because uh, you don't make money. The selling. margins are lower. Yeah, you don't make money selling that. So yeah. you know, all the money is in the silver yeah, and, yeah. or the gold. Uh, so it's nice to not have those assets in our portfolio. Right. This asset here, you know, for you know for what we paid for it, yep. you know, can, we think we can double the production. Okay. Uh, and, and that may sound, you know. Uh, uh, interesting to some because it did it was owned by a private company yes so there's really been no you know visibility from the street on right. this asset for you know six years right and the company that owned it prior to that owned it right as the market was crashing yep you know in 2015 they went bankrupt right at the yep. bottom of the market i wish i was around back then mm. uh because i would you know, snatch maybe, it yeah, up. Maybe, maybe we would have we would have picked it up back then but eric sprost did a fantastic job mm. in risking the asset for us you know, he took it out of bankruptcy. He spent over a hundred million dollars, you know, on the environmental side of the business. You know, building a water treatment plant. Yep. Did you see that today? We didn't see the water oh, treatment plant. Yeah. See yeah. It time. Well, you know, it's pretty state of the art facility. Right. You know that they built, and uh, so we took over this asset as a clean asset. Yeah. You know, all it needs is development and exploration. 
So, you know, we think life of mine can be doubled or tripled. Okay. We, we think uh, production can be doubled okay. in the next couple of years. It's not going to happen tomorrow. Okay. But our objective is by 2024. Okay. And, um, you know, I was impressed, you know, all these companies, it's all they're all built by people, right? So mm -hmm. I was impressed with, you know, the, the group of people that you already have on board. Yeah. You know, and they like working with First Majestic because you're a smaller company. If, if Michael wants to improve something, makes a phone call, you're going to get it done tomorrow versus right. a large bureaucratic organization where it's all the red tape takes months. Sure. Um, and then, you know, you're able to come here and spend a little bit more money you immediately boosted up the you know the, the uh, workers IRA plan right from 2% mm -hmm. to 5% yes, so right. it, everyone seems to be uh, you know happy working for you and, and, and you know that's what we try to do at First mm. Majestic is you know we try to you know really make a family environment right I take that really seriously the yeah. relationship we have with our workers is super important okay. because it's all on them mm -hmm. you know me in Vancouver what am I gonna do mm -hmm. you know, I, you know and it, it really takes people on the ground here and in Mexico that really you know spend the day to day Day. Right. If they don't have that connection with senior management, then things just get overlooked and things disappear. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, look, look at look, look at Primero for example. You know, right. San Dimas that was managed out of Canada. Yes. You know, this asset was managed out of Canada. Yes. You know, uh, um, and you just can't run operations like that. You can you need to have good quality skill set on the ground operating these things. Correct. You're the people on the ground and making decisions versus the suits up in the office with a spreadsheet. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. good. All right. Good luck. It was uh, great going on the tour today. It's an impressive operation, and I'm sure you'll be able to cost, cost down and start making some well, money. Well, that's the focus, right? Yeah. Because you know, we know the high costs are a little bit high. Right. Uh, and and uh, you know, we came in this with our eyes open, yeah. knowing that you know we, we could turn this thing around. And yeah. If you look at the last 20 years or last 19 years, because that's why you know, this 19-year-old company now, We've been great at turning assets around. Yes. You go back and look at every single acquisition we've done. Yep. We turn them all around. You know, and uh, it's whether it's costs, whether it's recoveries, mm. you know, whether it's production, you know, mm -hmm. lack, whatever lack of resources, mm -hmm. we've been able to turn around every asset we've ever bought. Right. And uh, we're going to turn this one around. Yep. Good. Awesome. Thanks for your time. Well, thanks for coming. Really yep. appreciate it. It was fun.